Hello everyone. This is, I guess, already the last lecture. Time went really fast. Um, so I hope you enjoy this one. Of course, we will see each other next week and I'm looking forward to read all your papers uh, in the coming days when they come in. Uh, but for now, today we will focus in my lecture on border imperialism and the criminalization of uh, refugees in Europe and the Netherlands, uh, specifically also the colonial origins of creating different and unequal citizenships, uh, the current situation of uh, specifically undocumented refugees in the Netherlands, but also the way they are protesting is something I will talk about, and the externalization of Europe's border policy. Um, yeah, these are the things I will discuss today. Um, so I will begin with the article that you had to read of uh, Gunnar Jones, uh, basically titled hey, What's New About Dutch Populism? And uh, I found this sentence maybe in, in this paper that put it, uh, yeah, the center statements really well, uh, was while present day right wing Dutch populism clearly proposes the enactment of unequal citizenship, Dutch politics of inequality certainly do not need populism. Uh, and yeah, as you can imagine, uh, you were reading from uh, last week and in the lecture of last week, you saw that populism is rising and more xenophobia and uh, uh, yeah, more uh, racist discourse is becoming more and more normalized, especially Islamophobic discourse in the Netherlands. But what Gunnar Jones in his article basically is saying, we didn't need populism for there to be discriminatory uh, uh, policies uh, uh, or, or racist policies and uh, he takes for this historic examples looking at how already through colonial times and different eras before populism was there uh, through means of citizenship different hierarchies opportunities economic positions uh, and rights and freedoms were created through uh, forms of unequal citizenship uh, so yeah, and he gives examples, and uh, some of these examples were that, for instance, in uh, the differences of citizenship between the motherland, so the Netherlands and the colonies, so uh, you, you had the Dutch East Indies, and there you had, the, which we had in one of the last weeks as well, you had an apartheid system where the, the inlanders, the indigenous, uh, of the Dutch East Indies were not granted the same rights, uh, were not allowed certain bureaucratic positions or certain jobs uh, within the state apparatus, uh, so, and were not allowed in the swimming pool or things like this. So there was a, a second class citizenship, a colonial citizenship. Uh, so in that way, uh, the, the Dutch state and bureaucracy was already uh, defining who is what, which citizens and which rights do they have. So this way of thinking is already deeply entrenched in, uh, in, in Dutch uh, culture or, or statecraft, let's say. And um, yeah, of course, uh, he gave another example, not of uh, colonialism in the East, but in the West, where, uh, of course, the humanity was denied of the enslaved people, uh, mostly uh, black Africans who were not deemed as human and therefore uh, would be allowed to be used as property. Uh, and, and so they were completely denied their humanity. Uh, and in that sense, there was a justification for the exploitation of them because they were seen as chattel, as, as uh, yeah property uh, so also this yeah it's not even citizenship it's becoming property but it's also a way of defining others and uh, making specific policies for specific groups um, yeah and besides these more colonial times and uh, uh, policies he's also talking uh, putting uh, that history into more recent history of uh, post Second World War history, where of course we had these different groups migrated to migrating to the Netherlands, to the motherland, and then also you saw had the citizenship of alienism. Uh, in, in Dutch, alienism is a vreemdelingenrecht, which means basically yeah, rights about aliens, the the, the, the foreigners. Uh, um, but yeah, there, there started to become debates: are they uh, you know uh, in line with our culture? Uh, Will they match? Uh, will they bring in danger? Things like this. So this, this kind of discourses that we hear coming up today is nothing new. Uh, this, this is something that has already been always been part of the, the Dutch identity, culture, and the ethno, uh, yeah, the ethnic state of a, a scene white uh, Dutch 
uh, state and, and citizenship. Um, so yeah, in that sense, huh, contrary to modernist, where it says in the other, in the other sentence, contrary to modernist uh, notions of citizenship, equality for all, colonialism and its aftermath demonstrates that the meaning of citizenship depends on agonistic processes in societies. And basically, yeah, the equality for all, which was based on the French Enlightenment uh, and, and the movement, equality for all, fraternité and things like this, this didn't mean for everyone. There was for a specific group uh, and others were excluded from uh, uh, this, let's say, equality for all. So it was equality for some, uh, better say. And uh, what I'd like to add to this reading, which wasn't in the reading, uh, but this is something Frans Fanon, as a decolonial and anti-colonial thinker, also uh, conceptualized in his, uh, in his uh, writings. And here he defined the zone of non-being, basically. And uh, in the zone of non-being, uh, Frans Fanon also uh, basically says, you have this realm of where you are allowed to to be human and of course there can be differences in uh, maybe class differences or, or uh, gender differences uh, but you're still in the zone of being you're still a human uh, but when you're below the racial line you become a non and yeah a non-human uh, so you become dehumanized or sub subhuman uh, and there's a different set of rules uh, whether you're uh, of another gender or not it doesn't matter if you're below that human line you get a certain um, yeah uh, non-human treatment uh, and I'll uh, write something of Jordan Rodriguez so it's another quote of Franz Fanon himself but someone who interpreted the readings of Fanon and he says uh, Fanon calls the zone of being and the humanity of these people is socially recognized through human social civil and labor rights those people who are below the line of the human are in the zone of non-being and are considered subhuman or non-human those people who are considered subhuman or non-human do not have their humanity socially recognized and it is in question. All right. And I think this is, this is an important concept uh, which you will see throughout the lecture where you will see that some rights, uh, yeah, so as such as labor rights, human rights, social rights uh, uh, are described to some and not to others uh, when they are excluded. Uh, so there are also uh, basically, if, if you would ask me, different forms uh, it's, uh, uh, in terms of uh, people being dehumanized or subhumanized uh, in, in current Dutch society, uh, which I will explain more uh, later, uh, but rather not on the, explicitly on the, on the base of their color, but on the base of their documents. So their, yeah, their allowance to, to be here. Um, yeah. So. One of the examples he gave, uh, Gunnar Jones, uh, where he was trying to explain, uh, to, to give an example in which way a people's citizenship or their status in the Dutch state or their identity is questioned. Are they allowed to stay here? Um, so it's not a given that they're welcome. And uh, one uh, specific law he gave uh, as an example that was proposed this wasn't uh i say it wasn't uh, implemented this law it was a proposal uh the largest party which has been the ruling party for the for the last few years the fifth day uh, which basically an, an sort of a neoliberal business oriented party uh, but not seen as an extreme right-wing party it was a proposal of this party uh, and our uh, prime minister uh, mark Rutte is also of this party and has been prime minister uh, two times in a row now uh, but he's from this party that uh, pr pr proposed this law um, so I'll, I'll read out some of the things that were in this law. So the Bosman Act, um, which was the name of the one who proposed this law from within the party. The Bosman Act proposal would set conditions for the establishment in the Netherlands of people from Curaçao, Saint Maarten and Aruba. In short, someone who wants to stay in the Netherlands for more than six months must uh, meet one of the four conditions, uh, have a job or your own company in the Netherlands, be able to provide their own maintenance with their own means, follow a recognized training in the Netherlands, being a family member of a Dutch person. Well, and only when a business permit has been granted can someone register with a municipality and is this person entitled, for, entitled to social benefits. So basically you have from former colonies, citizens uh, who, are, who have a Dutch nationality, but then don't get a permit to be here or have certain social allowances, or this 
will become in question and they need to meet certain conditions before they are allowed the same human rights as Dutch citizens. So this is a clear form of discrimination uh, uh, on the basis of people's background, creating unequal citizenships. Uh, now, this law wasn't uh, enacted finally, but it shows the way of thinking of thinking that you can owe, uh, because these groups from these islands were also very much stigmatized as criminals, etc. So then you get this list of sets like, okay, you're not welcome if blah, 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 blah. Uh, so yeah, this, this is, uh, was an example that he gave. And uh, yeah, you can read more about it uh, online uh, as well. So uh, other examples of unequal citizenship, I would say, are, for instance, uh, the recent law that have been passed uh, uh, with the people. Uh, yeah, they were called so-called jihadists, uh, but people were fighting in the Syrian war. Um, that the Dutch government would be allowed to take away their passport, so take away their Dutch nationality uh, in the case if they had two passports. Uh, so that also again is okay. You are Dutch citizens, except if, and this this doesn't go for Dutch people. This goes for people with another nationality. So that's also a distinction. Uh, and recently in the news, there has been a, a scandal again. Uh, this is not the first time that this is happening. But uh, just as the police does ethnic profiling on the streets, you have the uh, Dutch tax. Um, I said the. The tax bureaucracy, if they check if you paid everything uh, accordingly, uh, uh, it, it leaked out that uh, they were uh, ethnically profiling people with a, a second nationality. So basically what they would do is if you had a another passport, uh, another nationality, then they would do, uh, do extra double checks on you if you were doing your taxes right um and and uh, seeing if you were not fraudulent and this same scandal happened um one time when mark rutte again this is from the same party said that we should uh ethnically profile literally uh somali people uh for fraud um if they were allowed or not allowed to have social benefits and that we should specifically target this group and check them more so uh, this way of thinking uh, just as it has been institutionalized in the police force, is also in the yeah, tax bureaucracy. Uh, and of course, you had this uh, uh, allochtone versus autochtone, right? That the allochtone needs to uh, fulfill certain requirements. Um, and by the way, about this autochtone and allochtone uh, division, uh, since 2006, I forgot to mention it to you, it's not in use anymore by the government because they finally saw after so many years that it had such a stigma on people. Uh, so they're not using these uh, terms anymore, uh, just so you know. Um, but yeah, other, other things of, I would say, an equal citizenship is the way, the, like the very elaborate way uh, you have to do integration, in integration, integration courses in the Netherlands. Uh, but also another example, which I find really striking, is that uh, when you maybe fell, fall in love with someone from another country, uh, bringing your partner, like a gezinsherenigings, so or bringing your family together, uh, there's a whole list of requirements, like, the partner needs to have a certain income and you need to have a certain income and blah, blah, blah. So there's like a whole sets of uh, a list of demands uh, before your partner can be able to come here. So if you're a lower class worker and maybe for some reason she's not able uh, to take care of herself, then you're not allowed to bring your partner here uh, to live here. Um, which I found also, I mean, as a Dutch person, you have the right to marry whomever you want. It's not determined by your class, state or income. Uh, so that's also a form of unequal citizenship. And I mean, there's many more subtle or more explicit forms, but these are examples of, of, of distinctions made on different groups of people by the uh, yeah, Dutch legal system and state system. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk more now about uh, specifically the group of undocumented people uh, in Europe, but also specifically the Netherlands, uh, what they face, the, 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 yeah, uh, and the unequal inequality they have to face and the systemic and institutional discrimination and exclusion of uh, all sorts of rights, liberties, uh, that these people are not allowed to have when they are on uh, that soil. Um, so about this, this is a, a list of laws. I'm, I'm, I am gonna give some of these examples to show you how 
the laws on people, uh, yeah, the alien acts, let's say that the, the people who are not allowed to be here, according to the Dutch government, has become more strict, stricter, stricter over the uh, several years. So these groups of undocumented people in the Netherlands have been become more and more criminalized over the years. And I will give some uh, examples of these laws that are now criminalizing and, and put the people outside of the system inside the Netherlands. Uh, and this is a very invisibilized group also. Uh, so this is not the, 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 there's different kinds of refugees and migrants, so you have the ones who seek asylum and get it granted. And I'm talking specifically about the group who don't get it granted, uh, right, permit for whatever reason, uh, you might find agreeable or not agreeable, but I'm talking about the group that had, uh, had their status rejected and are here illegally. So the state says you're not allowed to be here. And these are the rules that have been changing and become more and more strict for this specific group. Um, so in 1993, uh, it became compulsory to carry identification documents at all times when you go out of your house. Uh, and this, yeah, this became implemented and this has everything to do also with uh, wanting to check if, if someone is walking on the street is allowed to be here, has a Dutch passport or not. Uh, and this, this was, uh, a long time at taboo to do this because of the Second World War. The Germans, of course, did these policies as well, but then for catching Jews. Uh, so this is kind of a, yeah, for, for some people it was like, hey, where are we going? You know, are we now forced to be always uh, able to identify? Uh, and uh, so this was in 1993. In uh, 1994, there was the Foreign Nationals Employment Act. Uh, and now, like beforehand, it was sort of condoned. Like if people worked without documents or permit here, uh, it wasn't, there weren't really sanctions on it. So people could just basically do it. Uh, but now employees were sanctioned. I mean, you can get uh, thousands of euros fined if the government catches you that you are employing people who are not allowed to work here. Uh, so basically, uh, it's now being criminalized more that undocumented people are working in the Netherlands. Uh, then in 1998, there was the Law on Identification and Benefit Entitlement Act. Uh, and this means basically that when you were undocumented and uh, yeah, not legally here, uh, you were now excluded for uh, social benefits, uh, let's say if you're unemployed, etc. But also provisions such as housing, education, welfare, etc. Uh, this excluded children, so children would still be allowed to go to education. But if you were an adult or after a certain age, you are uh, excluded from housing, education, uh, welfare benefits, everything. Uh, so now it says you're not entitled anymore uh, to these provisions, uh, except if you work with the Dutch government for your own return. Uh, so this, you can imagine, created an, uh, a lot of homelessness as well, because people were not allowed to live in houses anymore, etc., etc. Um so this, this, this was a really important uh, uh, change of law. Uh, they're really starting to exclude these groups of people uh, from the yeah, social uh, infrastructure that we have built in the Netherlands for all citizens. Uh, in, the, in the year 2000, uh, the revision, uh, uh, there was a revision uh, and there came, became an intensification and an expansion of authority for detecting aliens or the vreemdelingen. Uh, so now the authorities had more, uh, uh, yeah, means, got more uh, funding, but also uh, regulatory mechanisms to be able to find who is illegal here. So the, the, the surveillance, let's say surveillance economy became more and more there uh, and their authority got expanded in the year 2000 to do their work to catch the framedelingen, the ones who are not welcome here. Uh, and since 2010, uh, undocumented migrants found on Dutch territory could get an official uh, warrant to leave the country within 48 hours. If they would be found again after this 48 hours an official, uh, let's say, uh, uh, warning, uh, you could become uh, imprisoned in detention centers uh, for up to six months. And this could then again be prolonged. So you wouldn't have done anything criminal. You wouldn't have stealed anything. You're just there uh, illegal. Uh, and then you could be imprisoned for uh, months ahead and then can be prolonged. And this is without a judge intervening. This is just basically uh, you going on the street and you get picked up by the police and uh, sentenced to jail. And um, I mean, I know a story of people who work with refugees who literally, you know, you make an appointment with someone 
and then they show they don't show up anymore they don't pick up the phone and then they later hear the person has been uh, kidnapped by the police uh so this this th you have to imagine the fear that these people live in I, I've, I've seen also the, when when you organize a public event if there's police they're afraid to come because they're like maybe i'm gonna I'm going to be sentenced for months in, in, in one of these detention centers. So, uh, and these detention centers, there has been many reports by Amnesty International, uh, uh, the uh, European level courts that have said these are human rights violations because you're imprisoning and putting people in detention who haven't done anything criminal in that sense, except for being human. Uh, and, and, and sometimes they had less uh, freedom of movement or less hours outside, for instance, hey, if you're in prison, you can walk in the yard, less time than, than actual criminals. So sometimes it would have been even harsher treatment or, 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 or uh, yeah, than, than actual criminals in the who, who have done an offense. Um, and uh, another um, uh, law that became enacted was in 2014. And uh, since then, the authorities have been allowed to do house raids uh, without a warrant. So this is, again, without a judge intervening uh, when pe people are suspected of housing or aiding uh, illegal immigrants. Uh, so let's say if maybe they suspect you of keeping down documents uh, and then they can basically, uh, I think the only thing that was prohibited was to uh, tear down your walls, but they are allowed to open your computers, to, to, to open your car, your phone, everything, uh, uh, search you on your body, everything. So, um, and we, without a warrant from a judge. Uh, so this is for the friendly police, the alien police. Um, so yeah, you have to imagine this, this is really some crucial changes in terms of uh, law and what the authorities are entitled to without intervention of a judge. So you're now allowed to ask people on their identity, uh, jail them if they can't prove their, that you're uh, allowed to reside here for months on end, and you can do house raids without a judge intervening. So this is now, uh, things that are allowed and uh, yeah, it's incredible. And there's not been, been much public debates about how far this actually goes. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, current reality in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, and I, one of the articles that you had to read, which I really liked this uh, sentence uh, that said, in a political system where possessing legitimate identification papers is a basic condition for the exercise of freedom, every aspect of life of an undocumented migrant is considered illegal. And I think this is also where the zone of non-being comes in of Frans van Non, although it's not based on the color line, it's now based on documents, which of course behind that has color line, of course, because who has the right documents uh, are often people of color. But um, you can see your really, your entire being is made illegal uh, in the Netherlands. And the consequences are huge for these uh, groups. So you have no right to good working standards and protection, uh, and you're vulnerable for exploitation. So what you see a lot is that these people, um, they can't go, they're afraid to go to the state if they're being exploited, or if their work hours are, let's say, seven days a week uh, for very low wages in uh, either restaurants or cleaning, or, or uh, this happens a lot in agriculture in Europe as well, uh, that they're exploited there. Uh, but you can't go anywhere because you're not allowed to work. The, the employer gets a fine. The employer also said, well, if you, if you go tell someone uh, that I'm exploiting you, then I will go to the alien police and you will be deported. So this creates, you know, we had all these labor rights uh, fixed in Europe. But once you're undocumented and illegal, you, you just can't protect yourself uh, good anymore uh, because you're excluded um from from these rights basically um and the same goes for good health care housing and education uh so basically you you have to roam the streets um and uh yeah and and you can, yeah so all kinds of access that other people have are there and i mean there is some minimum things uh it's not that black and white i'll, I'll go into that later uh, but in general, it's, it's not the same for Dutch citizen or if you're uh, undocumented. Uh, you're, you're very 
uh, vulnerable for human trafficking, also illegal works, uh, sex trafficking, things like this happened. You have stories of refugees being uh, abused by mafias and things like this uh, because they are not able to protect themselves towards the authorities because the authorities are their enemies. Um, yeah, so you have to constantly live in fear, uh, afraid on the streets, etc. Uh, and you have to be, yeah, the risk of being jailed for months uh, and risk of being uh, deported against your will. Um, yeah, so as I said earlier, I guess they're pushed in the side, in the yeah, zone of non-being. Uh, and just to give you, I like from the uh, Guardian article that you had to read one quote that really put it well, also the consequences of being illegal, also psychologically uh, for you as a human being uh, living and trying to uh, be part of society, because that's what usually people want. They want to contribute. They want to come here, work, make a living, interact with people. Uh, uh, but being made into an illegal position uh, really has psychological consequences. Uh, and I, I like this uh, uh, Guardian quote of uh, Tash Ao. Uh, and he said, my father worked in the lowest of shitty jobs as a plunger, a dishwasher in Chinese restaurants, that sort of thing. I could feel his shame at being an illegal immigrant every time he talked to anyone. I could hear it in his voice. He felt crushed by the world. Why? I asked myself. Why do we have to live with this shame? I would go home at night and cry myself to sleep. Because they were illegals, my parents were forced to accept their position at the bottom of the ladder. And their inferiority complex colored my experience of life, even at that age. And uh, end quote. And this is also something, if, if, if you speak to undocumented refugees, this is one of the most difficult things. Uh, I mean, so most people who are undocumented in the Netherlands, they find like these sh shitty jobs somewhere else at the bottom of the ladder. Um, but what happens also a lot is that people become in a limbo. So they're waiting for the status. Is, is it if sometimes for a year if it's going to be approved or not? And, 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 or they're uh, roaming sometimes. I've, I've had cases for people who have roamed the streets for 16 years uh, in the Netherlands without being allowed to work, to do uh, all these things or participate, not open a bank account, nothing. So then um, uh, you become very invisibilized to society and, and you're not able to contribute and this is uh, and you and you become constantly uh, dependent on the uh, uh, let's say the people who want to do good to give you bags of food and, and things to uh, provide because uh, the government doesn't do it a lot uh, for these specific groups and uh, so, so you can imagine yeah you become in a limbo of nothingness and it, this really creates huge depressions and uh, yeah feelings of isolation because you're not allowed uh, like, like work and these kind of things having these interactions be able is, is uh, important for you as a human being to be connected uh, which is just uh, not allowed if you're a part of that group um, so uh, yeah I mean there's Amnesty International reports also of abuse of people who have been in these prisons uh, who, who don't take care of people with sometimes war traumas, rape victims and things like this. And then they be thrown in isolation cells, things like this. So there's, there's many, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a form of abuse. Um, and there's uh, also international reports about these. And also the European uh, Commission, so that you have the European courts. They also said, uh, said they had a few times uh, said uh, that the Netherlands is uh, committing crimes against, uh, yeah, as, uh, I say, uh, is breaking these laws on uh, human rights, uh, especially also because uh, children were also imprisoned. Uh, so this is now happening less and less, almost, I think, not anymore, I'm not sure. Um, but, but yeah, I uh, know oh children are still put in prisons as well, but they're like sort of in between family prisons, they call it. And these are like in between prisons before groups get uh, deported. Um, so then you're sort of jailed in a confined territory uh, with more movement of space. That's why they themselves don't call it a prison, but it's still a prison. The children don't want to be there. The parents don't want to be there. Uh, and that they have to wait for their deportation. Uh, so in that sense, can children uh, still jailed in the Netherlands? Uh, well, yeah. Um, and um, so this was in 2014. 
uh, that the Europe, highest European Commission said that the Netherlands is breaking these laws uh, and also breaking the laws on, on uh, racism and things like this. And uh, so what happened after 2014 when this happened, um, the Netherlands, because they weren't also, that this was an important thing of the report, the, the, what the Commission said, said uh, that uh, uh, housing, food and uh, being able to wash yourself, these are uh, basic human rights as well that the Dutch government should provide for anyone on Dutch soil. So that what the Dutch government did is provide bed, bath, bread. So it's called bed, bath, and bread. Um, so basically, doing as minimum as possible for this group. Um, and basically, uh, they have now sort of temporary shelters. Not enough, but they have uh, some of these. And they have like a uh, morning clock and an evening clock. So you have to be in before nine. Um, nine in the evening otherwise uh, you're not allowed to sleep there anymore so it closes the door and then you have to leave at nine in the morning again so then you have to be on the street even if even if it's winter or whatnot you have to be on the streets the whole day start events for instance uh, that people had to leave before the end of the event because they have an evening clock they need to be there um, and uh, in the morning and in the winter they're left out on the street without work so, I mean, this is not a human solution. They, they really tried to do it as minimum as possible to meet these requirements. Um, and there's also been protests against these, um, yeah, these developments. Um, yeah, and what was interesting, <laughs> this, this one I found really funny when I was doing research for this lecture. Uh, so the European Commission said that the Dutch are breaking the law on human rights, right, for its refugees. And, did, and then this as a response a year later is what the highest Dutch court says to this ruling. <laughs> um, in 2015, the highest Dutch courts found that neither Article 13 nor Article 31 of the AECS, which were these uh, human rights uh, conventions, were binding, binding and accordingly could not be applied to Dutch courts directly. The Council of State found that the government of the Netherlands was entitled to demand a person cooperation with the return procedure in return for being offered shelter while awaiting return. Next, in 2016, the Council of State concluded again that the municipality of Amsterdam has no domestic nor international legal obligation to provide shelter to undocumented uh, migrants and that existing night shelter facilities should be regarded as favorable policy outside the law. So basically as a response, <laughs> the Dutch court said, no, these international treaties were not binding to the Netherlands. Um, and uh, the Netherlands is allowed to make attachments to when they use these facilities, because when people use these facilities, they have to work with the state for their right of return. So maybe some people don't want to go there because then they have to work with the authorities to work on their own deportation, which they obviously don't want. Uh, yeah, so, and then also it's not seen as obligatory according to the highest council of Dutch aid, but a favor of policy is like a, a, a Dutch benevolence. Uh, this, it, this was not something that was required. It was a Dutch benevolence. This was their interpretation, uh, which I found, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, very interesting. And I'm not a legal expert, but I just found these two diverging conclusions very interesting that the European Commission is saying, okay, this is discriminatory, dehumanizing, breaking children's rights, et cetera, et cetera. And do you, do you not provide shelter? And then you come with this response. I find, I find it quite uh, interesting and telling also. Um, yeah, so this is the situation of uh, undocumented refugees in the Netherlands. Um, also, I have to say there's many more. Uh, I'm going to talk about now an action group who's organizing uh, surrounding undocumented refugees and the actions that are, they are taking against uh, the system. Um, I have to say there's there's different layers of groups. It's all legal messy. Um, so the group that I'm going to talk about is a bit smaller. So most people who are undocumented in the Netherlands, they just work and live here illegally. And then you might ask, oh, well, how can they live here illegally? It's because um, uh, until I think 2007 and those who came here before the year 2000 who were here undocumented, they get a, had a sort of exception statement to be allowed to live here. And because for a lot of people, uh, deportation is not possible because either their own government doesn't allow it and there can be all kinds of reasons or their nationalities uh, unknown, etc. Uh, but there was an exception made for people who fell under the 1965 Alien Act. And this was made in 2007 
because a lot of people, uh, because when they uh, criminalized having a home, uh, a lot of people became homeless. So uh, the homeless problems became increasing and that's also a big problem. Uh, so it was better to let them stay in houses. So there's a, a huge chunk of people, I think it was around 20,000 I read in a amnesty report that were now allowed to have a house, but still be excluded with a lot of things, but to be allowed to rent a house in the Netherlands. So the group that I'm talking now about that is organizing these are groups and refugees that became after the year 2000, when this stricter act came uh, to the Netherlands and who are in this limbo of not being allowed to stay here um, uh, or of whom assigned have been rejected. And still most of these groups are doing things illegally, uh, but a part of this group decided, hey, we're gonna stop and protest. And this group uh, is in the We Are Here group and also Amsterdam City Rights working on this. Um, they're doing actions, uh, which I'm gonna talk about now. And of course, the name says a lot as well. We are here. We exist. We claim our existence. Acknowledge us. Give us our rights. Right? Um, and uh, yeah, so they have they've been doing protests to go beyond the social and political attitudes that criminalize them and that aim to turn undocumented migrants into fearful and passive subjects. Right? What I talked about, the fear and the constant threat of being taken down and deported uh, and yeah, being invisible and passive and for a lot of people in the Netherlands unknown that they even exist. Um, and um, uh, what they do, I will talk how they do this. I will talk about more in the actions that they do. Uh, and I want to read uh, part of their manifesto to, so you can read their own words as well. Uh, yeah, uh, and here they state, here in the Netherlands, our existence is structurally denied. But this does not mean that we do not exist. We are here. We are living on the streets or in temporary shelters. We are living in a political and legal vacuum, a vacuum that can only be filled by the recognition of our situation and our needs. Our lives have been put on hold because we don't have papers, but we refuse to have our existence denied any longer. We refuse to remain invisible. We refuse to remain victims. We demand a structural solution for anyone who is in our situation and for all others who might find themselves trapped in the same political and legal vacuum. We demand recognition of our existence. We demand our existence to be acknowledged in official policies and laws. We are here and we will remain here. Part of the manifesto. About the actions. Um, this group, who's just not allowed uh, shelter and these things in a human way, um, they started to do more and more collaborations with the squatting movement in Amsterdam uh, and also other cities, but uh, the squatting movement in Amsterdam is quite big, uh, has been policed a lot as well, but it's still vibe, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, so they, they squat buildings and buildings and they get evicted. Uh, again and again. So basically they are squatting houses and uh, uh, that are empty and then they uh, in these houses they start to organize political events, do music events, uh, uh, organize dialogues, uh, uh, dinners uh, with the neighborhood and things like this. So they become uh, from the invisible position they start to regain visibility and, and come together instead of being isolated if individuals uh, invisible on the streets they started to collectively squat together with the squatters movement and organize politically, formulate demands to do media actions, things like this. So uh, this way making themselves visible. Uh, and now they also battle for 24 hour shelter. So yeah, this bed pop broke with this evening and morning clock where you put out on the streets again. So now they demand uh, for 24 hour shelter. Uh, that's something they're uh, protesting for here. To them now and another thing that i didn't include uh, in this slide but what they're protesting for now is, as well as an amsterdam pass so they ask because the dutch government is going to give them rights but a pa an amsterdam pass would be basically saying okay on in on the uh, amsterdam soil you're allowed to do certain things uh, more than uh, it's the case now but this is still not tangible and not happening and a 24-hour shelter will be something uh, which will be achieved in the close future, probably not for everyone, but for as many po people as possible. So that means that the housing that they give the municipality is now 24 hours open instead of with this morning and evening clock to be a bit more humane. Downside is 
that Amsterdam municipality is also being forced by the central government that in these 24 hour shelters, people again have to work with the Dutch authorities for their return. So, um, yeah, I could say this has been really successful protest this group since the beginning that they started they started i think about 10 or 12 years ago i don't know out of my head uh but i mean they are now in constant dialogue with the municipality and working towards solutions and i mean it's far from perfect and messy but it's quite unique uh, that this kind of protest and visibility has been happening uh, from this specific and very vulnerable uh, group so um, in the last part, and I will make this one a bit shorter because I think I'm uh, lecturing already quite long. Um, I will talk about more about e e EU's uh, deadly border imperialism uh, and the way Europe is externalizing uh, their borders uh, to keep refugees out. But before I start, uh, I wanted to give some figures uh, about the uh, yeah, refugees worldwide and how much of this uh, actually comes to Europe because uh, yeah there's a lot of fiction and people give statements like there's tsunami of refugees coming and things like this um, so uh, it's good to have some figures to, to contextualize these a bit and nuance them and uh, see what's actually the case so uh, worldwide there are 70.8 million refugees uh, in 2018 uh, who are fleeing from war and violence uh, so it might be a, a bit more or less, but uh, around that figure. And of these 70.8 million, only 0.8% or yeah, a bit more than half a million asked for asylum in Europe. So that's, that's yeah, less than 1% of these total refugees actually go to Europe. Um, and within then Europe, uh, how they are divided, uh, yeah, more than a quarter are taken by Germany. And France is the second largest, taking up to 20%. And in the Netherlands, uh, of this total amount in 2018, uh, only uh, 20,000 20, people asked the same in the Netherlands, which was only around uh, 3% of the refugees uh, in Europe that actually go to the Netherlands. So also this whole populism thing about the refugees are coming with the... Yeah, this is just uh, a bit out of proportion. Uh, and this... Of course, the Netherlands is a smaller country than Germany, but this is also way relatively less per head uh, than what this Germany is doing for refugees. Um, yeah, and another statistic I found uh, was that 84% of the refugees worldwide anyhow remain in uh, developing countries. Uh, so usually when you are a refugee, you stay close to the uh, country where you, you are uh, fleeing from. Uh, also because people want to return or the languages are or the cultural systems are more yeah uh, closely related there's all kinds of reasons uh, but usually people stick around a bit more closer to home uh, and these were numbers i took from flüchtlinge uh, nl it's a organization uh, that documents uh, and helps refugees in the netherlands and uh, these were mostly taken from uh, un figures and euro figures um yeah, so then you also had to read the article on border imperialism by Nick Buxton and Mark Ackerman. I really love this article. Um, but yeah, there they describe how eh, migration control is at the heart that of EU, EU foreign policy. And uh, yeah, the reason for this European re-engagement with African territory and not just political and economic dominance has been largely due to one factor, a desire to control migration. So what you see now, and that's what they're describing, more and more deals and foreign relations uh, uh, and relationship with country are now also, uh, 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 it's not only economic and political, but it's also about migration. Uh, so you had the EU-Turkey deal about Syrian refugees, which was one of the largest uh, migration refugee deals made, uh, basically, uh, where Europe would give sums of money to Turkey to house refugees, but then we would be able to deport refugees to Turkey. Yeah, I, don't, I find these kind of things morally quite bizarre. I mean, people should be allowed to go where they would like to go. And then, uh, yeah, we're just putting some of money and trading humans and, and uh, yeah, uh, deporting them to places where, uh, yeah, I find it quite uh, bizarre morally. But uh, yeah, these things are happening more and more. Um, 
Yeah, so the EU now is uh, doing this kind of migration control policies and international policies and relationship with over 35 neighboring countries right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, with these 35 countries, they have different uh, deals uh, on, migra on limiting migration and refugee uh, uh, yeah, uh, exchange. Um, and uh, some of these requirements in, this, in these policies are uh, that, that I found from the article were, well, sig signatory uh, nations uh, must accept deported migrants from Europe. So when someone reaches Europe, we should be, you should accept the refugees that we want to deport to your countries. Um, you have to increase the border controls and staff on borders. So, you know, there's more and more walls you see created, uh, people policing borders, etc. cetera. Uh, introduce more ID control systems to monitor migrants and uh, build detention camps to detain refugees. So these are some of the agreements that are uh, that Europe is now doing with more than 35 countries outside Europe uh, surrounding migration. Um, yeah, and you can imagine uh, that this costs a lot of money and Europe pays also these countries to do this. And we'll get into this and the numbers and what kind of regimes Europe is also uh, dealing with and making agreements with. Uh, to hold migration. Um, yeah, and then uh, I like this part also, hey, um, in, in terms of historic sense and the relationship of Europe with Africa and its imperialism, uh, I like this quote. Oh, there's a phone. Oh, one second. I have to pause for it. All right, I'm back. The phone's quiet now. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I like to uh, read out this quote. It is noticeable in terms of historical echoes for the EU border imperialism that while the scramble for Africa was largely defended by its colonial, colonial apologist for its potential to civilize the barbarians at Europe's gates, the focus this time seems to be only about keeping the barbarians from passing through Europe's gates. Uh, right, so we're engaging a lot of... Uh, we have a lot of countries to keep the barbarians and the threat out. Uh, but of course, the people are not welcome, but their resources and their oil, everything, their goods are welcome, of course, uh, and their taxes, because uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, I don't know if you know, you can Google it, but the, the Netherlands is also very known for their tax havens. So a lot of uh, uh, companies and multinationals don't pay taxes in these different countries. Um, they pay the tax in Netherlands for very low tariff, uh, things like this. Uh, so yeah, money and goods welcome people, no. Um, uh, so, oh yeah, this map I found a good visual. Uh, here you can see the 35 countries that uh, they were talking, were talking about uh, visually mapped where we have these migration deals. So you can really see this had the externalization of Europe's border. You see that Europe's border policy is already going halfway uh, uh, up to the point of Sub-Saharan Africa with all these countries there for migration deals. Um, and some of the figures that they gave uh, that 48% of these countries which they have these deals with are authority, uh, author, uh, authoritarian governments, so not respecting democracy or human rights and things like this. Uh, and a lot of them are still developing countries who actually can spend their money more wise than policing the refugees that should come to Europe uh, better on housing or education, things like this. Uh, why spend money on a migration police for Europe, right? Uh, but yeah, this is being uh, done and implemented. And of course, this costs money, right? What I told you. So what happens now that 80% of this budget that goes to these kind of projects um, comes from the European Development Fund. Uh, or other development and humanitarian aid funds. So, uh, so we have humanitarian aid funds to help countries develop, right? Uh, so uh, this budget for this keeping refugees away, 80% of this budget comes from these funds. So I don't know exactly, I couldn't find the exact percentage that we're spending on this uh, from the total aid budget, but basically you have to imagine like huge sums of money of development aid money goes now to uh, yeah stopping migrants from coming to Europe. So this money had, could have been spent 
for people to improve the economic situation in different countries, which might also lead to less refugees, right? If their economic situation is better, and if there's less poverty, maybe people want to stay in the place where they are. So that can also be a better way to spend your development money, but now it goes to policing it. And of course, there's a lot of interest as well for certain companies to have it this way. Um, and you can see huge increase uh, in, in border companies and the amount of, if, if you just Google, amount of walls that are, have been being built over the last decade, etc. You can uh, yeah, see everything is increasing. And uh, for instance, the Coast Guard and Border Agency Frontex, so this is uh, yeah, a policing company basically for uh, helping to secure, securitize borders. Uh, Frontex budget went between 2005 and 2018, went from 6 million to 320 million that's like a, I don't know it's like a I don't know how many times increase of budget and um, uh, the total value of license issued by EU member states for arms export to these 35 countries in the decade of 2007 and 2016 is over 122 billion so 122 billion went in terms of arms arms exports to these 35 countries so yeah there's been a huge increase in securitization in uh, all these uh, countries who have to keep our migrants out and 20 percent of these countries uh, have actually had a eu or un arms embargo in force because they had so many human rights violations uh, but they still receive arms from some of the eu member states so uh, this also creates a lot of human rights violations because you're arming, policing, training, equipping dictatorial regimes of which people then might become afterwards refugees as well. So this is also really counterproductive, um, well, for society at least, not for these companies. Um, but yeah, so so this this is also creates a blowback. Um, and what you can see also because of this increased securitization is that the refugees who try to cross the Mediterranean Sea to Europe need to take much more dangerous and risky routes uh, these days. Uh, so for instance, between 2015 and 2017, uh, you could see the death rate of people, how many people have survived crossing the sea. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, people had a five times more chance to uh, drown in the sea. Uh, because they yeah usually could take just a short route to cross the sea and now they have to take long long routes not to be uh catch by coastal guards um and well the fi figures are just staggering like uh since 1997 uh 34 000 document this is document you can imagine a lot of people who drown never get found right but since 1997 34 thousand cases have been documented of deaths of refugees and migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so this has been from uh, covering news articles and volunteers who have just documented, oh, so many bodies have been drowned. And this number is 34,000 uh, at this point, and it's up and running. Uh, yeah, and another consequence, of course, besides the death toll that is increasing because of this uh, increased securitization is the human rights violations that are increasing as well. Uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you think the Netherlands is already abusing and uh, putting too much violence on refugees, you can imagine what's happening in different contexts with maybe authoritarian regimes, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, you had in Libya, uh, the, the even slave markets now uh, being reintroduced uh, where black people are being sold uh, into slavery. Um, and, and, and this has everything to do uh, with war industries and everything and uh, yeah, dis destruction of places. Um, yeah. And of course, there's an increase in illegal human smuggling networks now. Um, and this is also funny or funny. It's uh, ironic um, that activists who are now trying to help refugees who are drowning at the sea are being sued by European states uh, that they're aiding refugees, um, that they're aiding the smugglers. So now, now you have court cases against activists who try to help people from drowning. They're being accused of uh, helping uh, refugees, uh, yeah, of helping, of, of being a human smuggler. Uh, now they haven't been evicted in the end. Like, uh, of course, this is ludicrous. 
because they haven't been transferred money to do this. Um, they're just trying to save lives. Uh, so, uh, but this you can imagine that this gives a lot of threat or pressure on activists to do this or not do this because you have to pay a lawyer, go two years to courts or whatnot uh, to, to prove your innocence. And so it's, also you see more and more the criminalization of people who try to help refugees in Europe and also these house rates eh, you saw in the Netherlands where if you're, you're aiding undocumented refugees, your house might be raided. So these are kind of uh, uh, things of fear uh, that, that are happening to, to pressure people not to help these groups uh, from being here. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to close off my uh, lecture just by giving some bullet points. These are not all, and I'm not going to read them out, uh, for, but the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, hey, the right to life, ob obligation to respect human rights, well, there's all kinds of things, uh, right to fair trial, and just think about it. What do these papers mean for this specific group? Um, yeah. You can uh, just click pause, read through it, and think uh, what do these conventions mean at the moment? All right. Uh, that was the question for you to answer. Um, this was my last lecture. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. And uh, we, we will speak about this uh, next week when we see each other. All right. Goodbye.